Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this meeting of the Russell Coates Art Gallery and Museum Management Committee. Um, if this is a public meeting, and uh, I think it's helpful if we preface our uh, uh, agenda by just making individual introductions so that any members of the public who are watching us um, will know who is speaking. So perhaps if we start on the right, Alan. Alan Cross. No, I... Can you see my press it on? Yeah. Yes, the red. Alan Frost. Councillor Lawrence Williams. Stuart Bartholomew, Chairman. Councillor Mohan Oyinga. Caroline Bain, Solicitor in the Legal Department. Thank you all very much. Um, I now uh, invite you to um, consult your agendas and ask you, Nikki, whether we have any formal apologies. Thank you. Can I just confirm, can you hear me OK? Yes. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, mm. Yeah, Nikki, the Democratic Services Officer, I just want to say we've also got uh, Mr Greg Irvine online and Councillor Dunlop, who will be um, observing and participating today, but not formally voting. Um, and also uh, Michael Spender and Troy Smith from Officers. Um, apologies have been received from Sir George Merrick today. Nikki, thank you very much indeed. Um, I now invite any members to make a declaration of interest, which may be in conflict with their role this afternoon. Councillor Williams. Yes, I'd like to declare I'm a member of the Arts Council England. Thank you. If there are no other declarations, um, can I ask for confirmation of the minutes of the meeting, which took place on the 4th of May 2022? Um, I could take whether there are any amendments people wish to make but confirmation is how it's described on the agenda i believe we have assent in that matter in which case we can move to item four which is the um report on the performance of the russell coates art gallery and museum since may of this year and I invite you Sarah Newman to introduce the report. Thank you Chair. Um, so this uh, report has got two parts I think. Um, in terms of our performance, um, the Russell Coates has done incredibly well I think um, for the last uh, six months since the last May uh, the meeting. Um, we have seen as you can see our visitor numbers for the summer months um, recover to uh, pre-COVID levels to 2019. And I think actually we go back to 2017 to find a better a better summer um, for whatever reason, usually a mixture of reasons. Um, so the performance in terms of visitor numbers is excellent. Uh, we've accommodated the price rise to 8.50 that started on the 1st of September. There's been no adverse reactions whatsoever. And we have seen a 10% increase in income over, that, over the best uh, period um, so previously. So um, in terms of our performance, that's been very good. And that really bucks the trend, I think, across museums generally. Other people may know more um, about looking, most places looking at sort of 30% um, uh, reduction of visitor numbers, some as much as 50%. So to have achieved this is, is uh, quite impressive for the team. Um, and so it's been really good. We've had, I think that's part of it because we've had extremely good programming. Um, the uh, Lost Words exhibition was really very popular. Um, and um, the sixpence days brought large numbers in. Because of our um, centenary, we've done additional programming around um, children's activity days, late evening days, uh, evening openings, um, and these obviously brought a lot of people in. The sixpence days are bringing in maybe two to three, two to four hundred people in a day, whereas normally you might see one to two hundred. Um, late last week, we did a late themed around the Gothic, Victorian Gothic, and as I left the museum at five, well, as the museum 
continued opening at five o'clock, there was a queue of people outside the building, all dressed in Victorian Gothic costume. And we had something like 200 people in, um, you know, listening to talks and doing tours and things like that. So we've really hit a really good kind of model there, uh, which is really bringing in a sort of new, younger audience. So that's quite impressive. Um, programming's looking good. I've just given out um, this little booklet that we've done around the ceramics collection because we're seeking to um, increase the amount of uh, publishing we do around our fantastic collection. And um, Greg is working at the moment on a similar one on the trip to Japan. So this is part of our kind of plan to increase our, our offer. Um, and we've got coming up, uh, what just opened is the exhibition on um, narrative art, telling tales, which has opened successfully. And we are going to hold an exhibition on Lucy Kent Welsh. It's a fantastic equestrian artist who was born in Bournemouth. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we've received our fund a grant for that for £18,000. That will help the costs of that exhibition, which will open in the spring. And it's work, we're working in partnership with the um, National Horse Racing Museum. Uh, marketing's also been uh, very successful. So on a programming side and on income generation side, the cafe, the shop, all done very well. Um, um, so that is all going extremely well. I think the, um, the issue for us is probably just around making it sustainable. So it's a big ask for a very small team to deliver all that. Um, we hear on Wednesday whether we have NPO funding. Um, and if we do, that will go towards making that more sustainable. If we don't, we, will, uh, we have a plan for how we can make this scale it back enough to make it uh, feel comfortable for the team, um, but still delivering the same sort of level of, well, a similar level of um, engagement. Um, on the less positive side, um, the um, building of the museum is really almost, I would say, at tipping point. We have uh, you know, made the lack of maintenance on the building for so long. It's really um, causing us major problems. Um, so on Friday at four o'clock, when the heavens opened, we had water coming through in seven different rooms within the historic house. Um, so the conservatory, the sculpture terrace, all um, non-standing issues, but it's then coming through in such amounts into all the offices down below. Um, obviously, this is you know, a great two-star listed building with very fragile interiors, and it's really causing damage. The main issue at the moment is we have water coming in at the top of the cafe gallery stairs. If anyone's familiar, you go up into the thing, you go up through the cafe gallery stairs into the house. That's the main entrance and exit. We have water pouring through. So when it rains, we have to close that entire section, which means that everyone either has to come up in the lift which is not going to be able to sustain the number of visitors that we have, or they have to go up the metal fire escape. And there are times when I think that it's so serious. And obviously, any the water's coming down the stairs, it's impacts down below. And obviously, if anyone slips on that, it's a, it's a fall at height. So it's really kind of quite serious stuff. So, um, you know, over the weekends on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, the staff having to monitor that and manage that. Um, the lack of... Um, a lack of uh, maintenance in the staff room has led to um, uh, unwanted visitors as well, which is called, you know, is obviously isn't, is really not a pleasant place to, 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 for people to work. So that is um, only going to get worse. And the trouble is, it's not an easy, as you know, it's not an easy building to maintain, to sort out the um, issue with the cafe gallery. It's going to require scaffolding because you can't act, you know, the access is really, really difficult. Um, so that's an issue. And I, I worry, you know, about that because potentially we'd have to, you might have to close it. You have to evacuate the building if we can't um, manage it. And it requires, you know, if you've got seven leaks in seven places, you need a lot of staff to be able to manage that and the visitor off. And this is all happening, obviously, at the same time when we have got the um, government indemnity standard cover on our um, exhibition in the galleries, which requires two people on site the whole time to ensure that's covered continues. So it does put a very big strain on the team. So that's a real concern. And obviously, we're now going into uh, the winter and... Um, It'll start raining again and continue this strange weather we're having. Um, so the on the better on the uh, side, the repairs on the Russell Coates Road are going well. So we've just, as you'll see, the scaffolding's up on the Russell Coates Road, and we're doing some work around um, 
the um, window repair in the windows, they're doing the redecoration, lead work to stop leaks. So it's a little project um, that we've done uh, just to try and address some of those issues on the on the other side, the urgent issues, so rag bag of um, projects. But it's a lot of it's around the scaffolding issues. The scaffolding is so complex, it takes a week just to put scaffolding up. Um, that we, once you've got the scaffolding up, we just try and do everything that we can in that kind of thing. So that's going quite well. Um, the MEND project obviously will address some of this, but obviously only elements like the conservatory. Um, and that is continuing quite slow um, process um, because of the challenges around um, ordering, uh, the challenges around the whole complexity of the building and so on. So um, that's where we are with that. That continues. We're still now hoping that we will, I think I said in the last report, um, that we will get develop a plan, an agreed plan with our contractors um, that we can then order the parts because there's something like a 20 week waiting list for parts and then the work would start in the new year and the conservatory would hopefully start in the summer. I have put in another application to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport to address some more of the problems with the building and this is around the sculpture terrace. So we put in a large application to DCMS um, for basically a renovation of the front facade which is where all, a lot of these issues are and obviously that's the one that's exposed most to the sea. Um, and that would renovate the front facade and also allow access to the sculpture terrace for the first time. So it would be there'd be a great benefit in terms of to the visitor, but also there'd be great ben benefit to the building. Um, we don't hear the success of that um, until um, November, December. And if we get the money, then we would run that together with the conservatory project. We'd run those two together. That would be a lot of um, it, uh, it would make sense to do to do that. Um, so. Um, yeah, that's kind of where we are in terms of the building. Um, and I was just going to share a budget slide with everyone. Um, I'm going to challenge my, um, uh, challenge my tech. So hopefully this works well. Um, oh, you've seen that? Well, you probably. <laughs> You won't be able to see it over there. Um, so anyway, as I said, the, we um, just running through the income, uh, just wanted to share this with you. It's obviously quite challenging times. Um, so this shows, if you can see it, can anyone, you can't see it, can you? Oh, I do. That's a bit of a, okay, sorry, that's a bit of a fail, I'm sorry. Um, this will be circulated later. But um, in terms of our earned income from retail and catering, uh, after six months, this is a six month position, uh, we have generated 160,000 a target of 250,000, so that's well over half. Uh, admissions is 115,000 compared to a target of 188,000. Uh, sponsorship and donations is bang on half at 4,000. And we have other, gift, uh, other income from gift aid and grants, which is at the moment 49,000 out of 52, so we've almost got that. But some of that income is actually for next financial year. But anyway, the income position is extremely strong. and. Um, according to that, in the way the council works, um, we um, operate to the council just filling, the, filling the, the gap, as it were, and scheduled at this stage of the year to be providing £200,000 of grants, but actually all we've required is £98,000, so we're well, well up on, on target and down on um, income, but I have to move around. When we look at, um, oh dear. When we look at the expenditure side, um, staff costs are absolutely on track. I've done, I've used a sort of uh, Arts Council uh, model here to try and make sense of the budgets that we get from the council, which obviously look rather different. Um, so salaries are on track. Uh, direct activity costs, which are the costs around programming, which include the salaries of the curator and the programs officer and the education officer, um, are uh, there thereabouts. Um, oh, well, no, that we're under on that one. Um, and when we look at the overheads, obviously the main challenge is around utilities. So um, the budget, I think, for the financial year for electricity was something like £20,000. £20,000, right. um, which um, was low. But I can tell you that at the moment, well, recently our monthly uh, invoices were £9,000. So we're seeing a massive increase. And obviously, we don't know yet what the October figure will look like. So at the moment, you can see that we are so have, we're, the utility is 33,000, and we've actually spent 51. But that's not um, actually up to date. Um, so we're look, looking at that with obviously quite a lot of concern. And we are 
doing everything we can to try and reduce um, energy costs. Um, but obviously for us, it's around the humidity levels, not around the heating. So in the summer, we use a lot of energy to try and cool. And obviously it's been an incredibly hot summer. So trying to cool and to manage humidity levels. So that is a, a concern there, um, just what, what that will look like. Some costs won't come through to the end of the year, like the insurance and so on. Um, but other costs are, um, are um, going on to plan. So, so we are under budget um, in terms of expenditure and uh, we have increased income uh, with those concerns. As you probably know, the council has, the requirement is that we're not allowed to spend any money at the, in the council at the moment unless it's for income generation purposes. Um, there's been an embargo on, on expenditure um, but in our case, we don't have much in the way of budgets, and most of the budgets we spend are around income generation because they'll be around uh, programming or activities that will drive income. So it hasn't uh, made a lot of impact um, on, on us, really, in, in actual um, sense. So that's what I was going to stop sharing. And that's, that's my report. Sarah, thank you very much um, for that report and um, you know our congratulations as ever for the, um, the the very successful six months that you know the gallery has experienced over the um, summer period um, can I just um, ask you a few things about the building um, I was very troubled on a recent visit when you showed me some of the problems um, of rooms adjacent to your own office where there was water ingress and obviously the opportunity for other visitors to um, occupy spaces. Um, but the recent very wet weather has revealed underlying problems with the building. Um, there are two issues, it seems to me. One is about the, the necessary maintenance to sustain the building itself. The second is the problems that the lack of maintenance are causing, not only to the building, but also to the security of the collection, because obviously the amount of moisture that's coming in becomes a real issue with conservation of pictures and other very, very sensitive pieces which are being displayed. Um, I'm inviting you really, if you thought, thought forward a couple of years with the current problems of maintenance, what would you think would be the outcome? We stay as, 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 yes. as is. Well, I think you, the collection would be at significant risk and I don't think, to be honest, you could really open the building. I think you're at a tipping point where if it, nothing happens, then actually the visitor, it, it becomes unsafe for visitors to, to enter. I mean, I think that's almost where we, where we are. And, and the, um, as I said, the, um, you know, the impact, to, you know, the number of staff you'd need to just crisis manage, I, I, you know, it's, it would be really challenging. So I think, you know, I think, some, yeah, I do think something has to be done very significantly so soon. We have um, in our trust uh, a collection and a building, but we're also in, impaired from really taking the necessary actions because of the position in which the museum and gallery finds itself. I, I raise this um, because it will be an important issue for discussion later in our agenda, but clearly uh, some of the proposals which we've been formulating over a very long period of time are trying to put the museum and gallery in a constitutional and a financial position where it has genuine sustainability. But it seems to me that even that short report about building issues amplifies exactly some of the problems we're finding ourselves in and which get worse, not better. Are there any other comments that people would like to make about that part of the report? Alan. 
I just wanted to follow on from what you just said. Um, at the end of our agenda, we have a risk register. And it seems to me if you look at risk number 35, um, this is a subset of that, the water ingress. Um, I will still plan to say something about the risk register later, but it strikes me that we should, as a matter of urgency, meet as a subcommittee and deal with this issue um, because it is very, very serious. And, and if you look at you know, number 35, it's about global pandemic or other event closes museum. And from what I've just heard from Sarah, it's possible this could eventually close the museum. So I do think we need to uh, look at this really, really carefully. Thank you very much, Alan. And, and it's something that um, we would invite the portfolio holder to um, raise on our behalf. Um, uh, advise me, Nikki, is um, Beverly Dunlop now online to the meeting? Yes, uh, I can see Councillor Dunlop's there. Are you there, Councillor Dunlop? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I, think I, I, do, <laughs> I do apologise, Councillor Dunlop. Uh, you, you will be aware that the screen is really rather a long way away from where I'm sitting. And uh, I, it's quite difficult to pick up, um, you know, attendees, and particularly if attendees wish to make a contribution. So I will stop talking and invite you to speak if you so wish. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I'm sorry I can't be there. I'm, I'm in my car at the moment, so but I've parked somewhere reasonably quiet, which is why I don't have my uh, camera on. Um, I, I think, first of all, I'd like to reassure the committee that I am uh, as alarmed as everybody by the current situation. But as Sarah has said, all local authorities are facing considerable challenges at the moment. And I'm happy to talk this uh, through um, later if necessary. But um, you will be aware of the uh, considerable gaps we have in uh, the current year's budget in the 23-24 budget and as a result there's had to be a, a moratorium on, on spend um, until the budget is balanced. I don't believe we're far off that. Um, it's probably no comfort for me to tell you that we're probably in better shape than most authorities. Um, I think the quote from Hampshire is they've kind of stopped counting. There are considerable gaps around local authorities. It is something I will be raising and is something that it is at the forefront of my mind. Um, but it's going to have to be, I think, a conversation that sort of we go forward with um, and we, we talk about it a bit more. But um, all I can say today is I am painfully aware of the situation the Russell Coates Art Gallery Museum is in. Um, I don't know if that offers some kind of comfort, but it is very much um, at the top of my list. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> There's a, a few comments, if I may. Um, first of all, in no particular order, I thought I'd like to um, back up what Alan was saying about, um, you know, w w with some urgency. It's, it's not a new issue, of course, Sarah, you've raised it, Stuart, you've raised it several times with us about the building and uh, now the very pressing need. Um, and um, very, very keen that working group meets. If I'm part of it, I'm delighted to be. Um, but whatever is the right arrangement for that, Chairman, is fine. Um, so that's one thing. The um, interesting, you mentioned two years. I know you were actually just sort of, in a sense, just giving a sort of a putting a looking ahead. One could either take a two year view or actually one could even take a 10 year view. Now I'm making these figures up, but if you get my meaning, it's that uh, almost two years is a sort of a, a, a tactical stance around what would we do to kind of, um, you know, immediately repair, alleviate the problems we've got. A 10 to 20 of you would say something more fundamental, which is um, how would you kind of, you know, reshape or re sort of fabricate completely the innards of it. Um, I don't quite know what that looks like. And it's something so sensitive as this building, it would require some care. Um, but there's something there which I, it's probably now that we grab hold of that. And I'm not saying people haven't done that, but um, that's, that's also a worthwhile parallel discussion as well to look forward um, yeah, um, with that kind of horizon. Um, on a, on a, a lighter note, uh, let's not l leave it um, passing through too quickly. What a fabulous performance on the 
on the income side of things. Um, it, it, it's it's remarkable if, you, as you say, ten percent up, and then in other places, and I've seen this double figures of percent reductions in the income. You mentioned, so the right word, sustainability of that, which is every place is going through erratic income 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 patterns at the moment. Um, so I'll get through a few questions, but if can, can I get your comment, please, on um, and any others on, you know, in a sense, was was it some certain amount of good fortune that we've had a ten percent increase, and therefore, you know, should we ready ourselves for something much more sort of sedate or perhaps more difficult as we perhaps go into the winter and then next summer as well? Uh, that's something we probably ought to look at now. Um, also, the um, and I'm sorry if I missed it in the report is something about wh where the people came from and just what do we know about were they locals and it's tempting to think they were uh, when when belts are being tightened or was it not actually if you got a good feeling that it was people travelling and being here for longer stays as well anything on that would be useful um, just hopping on from that uh, the MPO decision okay it's imminent I, I noticed now we knew have a, a new prime minister by the way. Um, who was the only contender in the field, which therefore means probably a new Secretary of State for um, digital media and culture then, uh, probably being announced by the end of today or tomorrow. So that will be of interest for us and for everyone involved in the MPO, MPO process as well, and Arts Council, of course. So let's watch that one keenly. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, it doesn't mean any interruption to the NPO cycle at all. Um, and... The final thing, and this is my last point, on the targets for this year, and you um, you ran through where we were at the end of the summer season, let's call it, and then in some of them we're, we'd almost achieved the target and some we were on track. I'm just wondering now, are those targets for the full year still robust? Are they, are they still relevant for the full year? Because if any of them you think are looking quite toppy, whether it's revenue, admissions, or various other things, let's look at that now and start managing expectations between all of ourselves about where we think we're going to end up. Okay. Um, I may have more things, but I'll, I'll stop here and give, give away to others. Thank, Thank you. you very much for that. Um, Sarah, a response to those um, four questions? Um, yeah, I'll respond to the, my bits and um, so on. Yes, um, uh, why, yeah, sorry, why, why, it's been, why, why do we think it's been so successful? I think it's a mixture of things. I think when you look at uh, success, you know, you think of it as a three, you know, it's um, a good offer and the weather has an impact uh, and you have to have good marketing. Um, we had a good offer this summer with our lost words, you know, that was deliberately, it was quite an expensive show for us, but it was deliberately trying to reach a, a sort of more of a family audience. And that certainly did that. People were very moved by that. We also know there was a very good, um, mark, uh, very good merchandising opportunities. So we took just, we took 30,000 just on, uh, on merchandise for that exhibition alone, which is pretty good for us. Um, so, um, and we've we've got a new marketing strategy, um, which we got through from from Blue Sail. That was a, um, a result of the the um, investment from the Arts Council um, Cultural Recovery Fund, and so that's given us a bit more market market focus in how we're uh, trying to reach our audiences. Um, you know, we benefit. We know. I think you know, we're in a very one, very good offer. We're very keen, and we have been all the way through about really, really focusing on our visitor experience and ensuring that is as good as it can possibly be. So everything we do is around improving that visitor experience, whatever it might be. So I think it's a lot of things, and there's a certain amount of you know, lots of people coming into the conurbation into Bournemouth in the summer. In answer to your question about where they're from, I have to say we're not terribly good at this kind of um, trying to. You know, we do do surveys. Um, I don't think we've got enough details to know really kind of what's changed, if anything. As I left today, there were some people who'd just come down all the way from Birmingham today to see the museum. Sadly, we were closed, but hopefully they'll come back tomorrow. Um, so we do know that people will travel from quite a long way to, to come, but there are certain um, locals. So it is quite mixed, and we try and programme so that we do the, you know, the general offer, which is the kind of people on the beach and wanting something different, and then the much more specific is targeted at locals who are looking for experience. And we... It, so, so we're very uh, kept, um, aware of that. I mean, in terms of, it's interesting about the seasonality of it. We would always see slightly more in the summer than in the winter. But I have to say that every year, July, August, September, October, you, every year, one of those months will be the busiest month. But from one year to the next, we don't know. So October is as busy for us 
as July. We are, you know, it's that kind of audience. We get the summer family audience, but then the, you know, the sort of retired tend to come out, you know, in September, October, and we're as busy now as we were in July. It will tail off, but not massively. So January will be quiet, uh, but by February and March we'll be as busy as any other thing. So it's very, we are really quite lucky. And I was looking at uh, interesting, looking at Longleat. Apparently Longleat takes more money in the winter than it does in the summer. So actually a lot of it's around uh, programming. So if you can program it correctly, you can do it. So I am confident we can reach those um, those figures, um, um, that w the, the targets that we have uh, um, set. I hope that answers your question. And I think Councillor Williams wanted to talk about the NPO. Yes, just, just to reassure you, there won't be a delay. <clears throat> That, of course, Council Williams doesn't tell us the outcomes, does it? But we will know. I um, most definitely not on Wednesday. Um, uh, I I have said to Sarah that it will be wonderful if we are successful, but if we're not, we should not see the process of application as being negative. It's, for MPO, it's being in the game persistently. So one. Um, you know, uh, I'm hopeful, Sarah, but if things weren't as we really wish, we should not be, you know, deterred from keep keeping at it. The uh, second matter I wish to raise was just a, by way of congratulation. Um, the current exhibition, the story of Victorian narrative art, which also sort of parallels this um, a collection of, of portraits by Jack Dixon really are, you know, exhibitions of the highest standard. Um, I think the narrative um, uh, exhibition uh, really re-excites uh, not only myself, but a number of people I've spoken to who have, you know, had a lifetime of abstraction, just the the comfort that narrative can provide in these troubled times. It's an exhibition that is absolutely right for the moment and congratulations on it. And of course, to um, Kirsty Stonewall Walker, who is the create, uh, curator, very, very expert, and well-chosen works. Are there any other contributions, questions that people might wish to raise concerning the report. Um, Greg, um, I'm looking at you. I, if you have uh, anything to ask, please do feel that you can. OK, um, that allows us to move to. Um, uh, uh, sorry, go, go ahead, Mohan. Uh, could I just, uh, it's actually just a comment rather than a question. I, I think uh, uh, in, in a collegiate spirit with my former colleague, Councillor Dunlop, as cabinet member, I do recognise that, uh, Beverly, you did mention the um, embargo, and I know this is across um, many things at the moment and for the reasons that have been explained by the leader. Uh, but of course, you'll know, we all know, obviously, you know, an embargo on costs and then many things like we have, like... Um, the, the enterprise, which is the Russell Coates, is an income and a cost stream as well. And obviously then an embargo on costs has a risk of threatening an income stream. So one can actually, in embargoing costs, actually threaten a great amount, a greater amount of income coming into the council. As long as there's fair consideration of that point, um, that's the only thing I'm saying. Thank you. Beverly, you do have, I, I'm alert to the fact that you have a hand up, although that is about the size of a pinhead um, on the screen, but my apologies <laughs> for not identifying it earlier. Is that me? No, 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 My no, hand no, is no, even no. smaller. <laughs> it's the, um, well, you're more familiar with this than I, but against no, your it's... name, there's a tiny dot, which is a hand, I think. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, you can't make it wave in on this one. I think you can make it well, actually wave, can't you, on some things. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. Actually, I, I think Councillor Iyengar has just, just in the last moment, just erased something um, that I think is uh, that we... Uh, we probably need to look at if it's sort of this sort of uh, I'm, I'm using these are my words moratorium on spending but one thing that we 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 ought to consider and i think it's it's a conversation is that um are we what income might 
this be preventing the situation we're in? We have to keep closing things and we can't use them. So I think that's something we do need to consider. So um, thank you, Councillor Enger, for making me think about that because it's all very well saying, oh, I can't spend this, can't spend that. But just to be absolutely sure that it's not affecting um, the income and it's a good income that it's been brought in. Um, but I, I just wanted to say before we move on to the next item, um, as the portfolio holder, I would really like to congratulate Sarah, actually. I think that um, a really, really good job has been done. Um, I think the increased income is great. I think some of the um, some of the collections, I, I, uh, as everyone knows, I'm a great social media watcher. I watch what people say. I see how things are received. Um, and I think that it's all been received really, really well. It's 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 a great interest and uh, congratulations for pushing that income up. Um, and I think it just needs to be said because sometimes we don't say it often enough. I understand that um, we're facing difficulties and I think that pain is felt no more uh, than with Sarah as the um, person who's having to manage everything. So I just wanted to go on record to say thank you. Councillor Dunlop, thank you very much. I know that those are words that we all endorse, so um, uh, very, very well chosen. Item five is the one for which I have immense enthusiasm. Um, it is the item which addresses loans and disposals, which are within the remit of uh, the management committee, but more especially uh, the trustees. Um, and this uh, uh, particular item focuses on a number of things which may be passed to the Greenwich Maritime Museum. So um, I think, uh, Sarah, if you'd like just to uh, alert us to the proposals. Thank you. Um, I'll take you through um, acquisitions. acquisitions for, yes, for, so we'll go through it. I think you're happy to. Uh, acquisitions, just a few small um Things that would have come through largely donations or you know something off eBay, just things that, that fit with our collection. Um, for those new, those new to the um, um, to the com ca um, committee, although Greg, you'll know this more better than even I do. Um, we have a collection policy which I like outlines exactly what we're going to collect the collection because obviously we could collect anything. Um, so everything that we we, we um, take, either uh, we buy for very small amounts of money or that's given to us. Um, fits that kind of collection strategy. So we've just got a few things that have come in there, um, so quite fun things. Um, it, with loans, actually, we've, we've, these really have taken off again, so it's really um, impressive. Um, I think you'll see um, that we're... Lit. So we've just um, brought back from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam our amazing Japanese uh, lacquer process sake set, which is a, a set of 70 bowls that, that show... The Japanese lacquer process, and that went over to uh, the Rijksmuseum uh, for a few months in the summer. Sadly, didn't get to see it, um, but they had 79,000 visitors who did. Um, Dulwich uh, painting that's gone to Dulwich, and then at the moment we've got a number out uh, to Italy, to the Sainsbury Centre, Falmouth, Pallant House. Um, sadly, well, not sadly. I mean, sadly for us, um, our wonderful um, Pag Pagani um, sculptures, which are the extraordinary. Um, sculptures in the main hall, which are a mixture of bronze and marble. They're going up to the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds, which is a fantastic bit of promotion for us, uh, but we'll, we will miss them while they're gone. Uh, but that's about, I think, the first time we've lent, lent, lent sculpture, so that's really interesting. Um, and then um, in the future next year, obviously, Venus is going off to Munich. Um, and we've got more paintings going to Spain and Italy. Um, so it's really good to see that international loans have come back. I think that's actually probably more than we've ever had even pre-COVID. Um, so these are ambassadors for us um, out in Europe and beyond. And we know that they bring um, obviously recognition to the, to the collection and also bring visitors in. So that's uh, very good. Yeah, well, I, you're very modest. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you take the Kunsthalle in Munich, uh, you know, th th there it will be, and there will be Russell Coates Museum Gallery, Bournemouth. You know, this is, you know, uh, profiling at the very highest level. Um, and I don't, I think people underestimate 
just how significant that is. I did share with the committee, I, I was in Tokyo um, shortly, well, during the exhibition of pre-Raphaelite painting. And the one which they used for their advertisement was, of course, our Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And this was throughout Tokyo and in the underground system, which if any of you have ever been to Tokyo, can find you almost for the rest of your life <laughs> trying to find the appropriate exit. But there it was, you know, we were there. And um, I, was, um, I was delighted that, that, you know, that that's the way in which the exhibition was being publicised. So um, congratulations on this. Not least, it can be a, a very welcome source of income. Absolutely, indeed. And um, I mean, I know that we, when um, Venus went, came out, uh, was in Japan, I mean, we, I was talking to a Japanese visitor in the museum who had seen it in Tokyo and had come specifically because of that to Bournemouth to see it in person and see the rest of the collection. So it does have that kind of impact. And yes, I mean, the, the, the system, um, just for information, is sorry. Yeah, because that's uh, just uh, uh, before we move off this, just to, to take the two examples of the, um, I think it was the, the bowls coming back from the Rijksmuseum and then the, uh, the sculptures going up to Leeds. So one in and one out, for instance, on that one. Do we, do we um, can we sort of make tangible anything like a sort of a, a, what is it, a testimonial from the Rijksmuseum? I'm probably showing how little I know here, isn't it? Is that normal that they, for instance, they would write something which then we can display in the Russell Coates a sort of testimonial from them about how the bowls, how they were received, that exhibit was received um, in Holland, for instance, and then the fact that the sculptures are going up, in a sense, what, what, a, great, what a great testimonial to the, the value of what we've got here. And it, I love the fact that we're doing it by word of mouth here, but this is us here and a few others online. I won't know how many online now, but I just wonder is the way we can sort of capture the fact that these things have occurred and make them more widely known. No, it's interesting you said that such um, comments are from the staff actually to do that. Yes, I think, um, um, so they do obviously write back and, and send the details and thank us for what we've done. And we do try, um, where possible, to share that. So, you know, so that obviously sort of social media and things like the fact that things have gone out over there. And interestingly, um, yes, yeah, one of my colleagues was saying the same thing. I think they were asking about whether we could do some kind of Toblerone. I couldn't quite work it out. Toblerone device. We showed that when the sculptures went, there was something there to show, you know, that they'd gone off to the Henry Moore. So actually, yes, we do try and show in the museum that they've gone to to wherever. Um, so, yeah, so it's something we do need to, as you say, to, because I think people, as you say, complete, you know, it's so easy just to, no one dismisses the Russell Coates, but not to appreciate just the quality and the importance of the, and the significance of the collection. And just as uh, just to to um, take take further um, Stuart's point, the um, when there's a system, you know, there's a sort of convention in place. So when we loan uh, in Britain, uh, we it's it, the, the loan is free, but the the receiving institution pays all the costs. So there's no, we're not um, out of pocket. But when we loan abroad, we um, charge, and there is um, a, a benefit as, as well. Um, so we do um, charge, um, and so the, all that money that comes from that would then be um, invested, one hopes, into the collection um, and the conservation of the existing collection. So that's how it works. Or we've, when, we, when Venus went to Japan, we used the funds that we raised there to change all the lighting systems so they were compliant for GIS. So we use it, you know, I always deliberately use it to invest. There's no point, you know, these are, you know, we're, and, and there's a balance also because people come to to see Venus or whatever, and then they get there and find she's in Hamburg or Munich or whatever, then, uh, then there's an element of that. So, so it's, um, it's a balance. Um, so moving on to the exciting bit with the disposals, um, again, just to give um, a little bit of background to those who are new, um, the, um, in, like all museums in the past, um, curators have collected things not knowing quite where the museum was going or, or you know, for the future, or because that's what the museum was doing at the time. The, the, as people who are familiar with Bournemouth will know, there used to be like three museums, that, um, I can't remember what they're called, but the Rothsay Museum and various things, which also had collections from Russell Coates. And they're now in the Russell Coates. We don't have those additional museums. And at one point, the um, curator was collecting a lot of uh, maritime history, um, which obviously we don't think uh, uh, and our collection strategy has, has suggested that there is no occasion in the foreseeable future where we'll start showing, you know, ships, anchors or whatever in the middle of the, of the Russell Coates or that we'll ever be in a position for that to be right. You know, the Bournemouth does not have a, uh, a maritime history. Um, so 
it's better that these collections go to a collection that would be able to utilize them uh, and that that would then free up space that we've got to better look after our own collection. Um, so that's the, the context. And obviously there's a whole process which is just defined by the Museums Association to do this in an ethical way. Um, and so as far as possible, we transfer everything to a public museum. So it stays in the public um, sector, the public domain, I should say. Um, and only if nobody's interested, do we then look at uh, other options, which would be then sale or destruction if it's of no value. So I don't propose to go through them in any detail, but a lot of this stuff was collected. I think they thought it'd ship it was um, maritime related, but some of it turns out to be land surveying, in fact. Um, obviously, the um, staff from the maritime, the National, the Royal Museums Greenwich came to work with the, the curator to go through this. And um, and it, seemed, it may seem very over the top, possibly, very detailed, but it's as good protection both for you and for us that we go through this process of examining each and every one to make sure that it is uh, the right thing to do to... Um, to dispose of it because obviously it's a big move and sometimes in this process we uh, the curator has identified area something to be uh, disposed of and we've looked at it and gone actually that's not appropriate we need to hold on to that so it's a really useful process even though it may look very um, paper heavy so um i don't propose to go through and if anyone's got any particular questions but we're essentially um hopefully uh, passing on largely to the um, royal museums greenwich a lot of material and there is in there somewhere a um, collections. What is it? Disappeared on? Yes, it's in the last page. Oh, that's right. There's this... a collection, Lucy Cousins. I'm curious about why you wish to dispose of that. The reason we want to dispose of it is because it doesn't show the money that anyone has put in the box, and now that's not considered good practice. Because if you make a donation and your money just disappears, then uh, in terms of fundraising, it doesn't, it's not. not um, it's not good practice. People give money where they see that, you know, they, they add to money that's already there. And in fact, the more money you have in a donations box, <laughs> the more people will give, interestingly. And so that actually the, the fact that the money just disappears, um, although it's a very lovely thing, um, it means it's not um, it's not really usable anymore as a donations box. It doesn't, doesn't reach, reach current um, good practice standards. OK. Um, I think we need to formally approve uh, these uh, disposals. Um, are we in agreement that they should prog progress? Thank you very much. That allows us to move to the acquisitions briefly. Uh, no, I think, um, I think that's it. I think you're happy to... Um... Well, I think we can note these, can't we? Yes, I think to, to, the, the, the next um, appendix I put in, because unfortunately, I think last meeting, I managed to miss this off. You, and did, I just, you did. So that's this, right. this is an old, old one. I just wanted it to be on the, on the public record. So that's Good. why it's there. Thank you very much. Particularly concerned the Wedgwood Crocodile Sugar <laughs> Hole is noted. Good. That allows us um, to move um, to item uh, six, which is um, the committee work program. Uh, this is something I know, um, Mohan, you um, I recommended at a previous meeting. Um, does this um, go anywhere near satisfying your requirements or the requirements of the committee? Good. Um, in which case, um, we are in a position to move to item seven. Sorry, At chairman. which point? Oh, sorry. Nikki. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Chair. I just wanted to sort of cover off really on, on the work programme. Um, it's something I pulled together. I've added onto the bottom so that you'll see the last two rows uh, are sort of suggested dates at the moment for the externalisation. Obviously, anything that comes up that may involve work of the committee that is going to other committees can appear on that table. Uh, obviously, Sarah and I will work on that to, to maintain that. And just to let you know as well about the accounts um, that I spoke to Stephen White uh, a couple of weeks ago, hopeful that we will have them a little bit earlier. Um, I don't know if Stephen has yet, but I know he's planning to circulate them sort of informally, just sort of for a bit of a heads up. But we have new external auditors this year uh, that might be working to a slightly different timetable uh, this year. So 
we'll keep you in the loop on that. And as soon as we can get a date for a meeting to get those signed off, I will do that. It, it could be December or it could be early January, but I will liaise with uh, both you, Stuart, if that's OK, and with Sarah on getting a date for that. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, item, oh, sorry, Mohan. It just drew the thought that this is fine and it's a, it's, it's kind of brief, but then that's good because my, you know, the spirit of my request was this is brief and it's an aid memoir and it's on a page. Something um, is that there's probably something in there which is, unless I can't see it, is that on the MPO, if um, there's Wednesday and then the subsequent dates around that, which may be important, all fingers crossed, everything all wood being touched, um, which probably is useful to put into here. Again, the point being not just for a record, but for our readiness, our readiness for certain dates or for certain inputs on things. And the other thing, and actually with this, if I may, Nikki, is this, uh, whether this appears here or appears below the lines of thing, um, there are obviously key dates leading up to Cabinet and leading up to Council when, for instance, we need to make decisions because they will then form the papers that go towards full Council. And I should have to think sometimes it's considerably before the 3rd of January when papers are locked down for council on that date. So that would be a useful date for us to know. But you kind of decide between yourselves what's the right presentation of this. Yes, um, but thank the you. idea is to minimise surprises. That's all this is about. Minimise <laughs> surprises. We're always on the front foot anticipating these, these deadlines coming up. That was the point of this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I certainly agree. Um, the element of surprise is not something you need uh, for this whole process. I think we probably need to be careful. We're not duplicating work with the, the work programme that Sarah is producing specifically uh, for externalisation. Um, and this, which should be sort of probably a little bit more about the whole work of the committee. Um, I don't want to duplicate things, but certainly don't want to miss anything either. So happy to work with with everyone on on how we sort of reach that balance. And perhaps as we get into the project a little bit more, it may be something that that is a defined separate work program, which is just for the externalisation. But I say happy to to work with people on how best we we share that and, and make sure that it's as up to date as possible. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, I think I am able now to move to item seven, um, and this um, is the exclusion of press and public. And I think it's um, uh, a requirement that I just read that under section 100A stroke four of the Local Government Act of 1972, the public may be excluded from the meeting for the following items of business on the grounds that they involve the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph three of part one of the scheduled 12A of the Act, and that the public interest in withholding the information outweighs such interest in disclosing the information. Uh, having said that, I now look for the live stream to be completed.